As the global demand for smartphones soars, the sources of some of the rare components are becoming exhausted. So how will phones of the future be built? And Supreme Court battle for phone design supremacy. The multi-million dollar battle between Apple and Samsung. I'm Martin Stanford. This is Insight. Welcome to Insight. Did you know the smooth running of almost every piece of technology you use is down to something called a rare earth metal? What is a rare earth metal? There are a group of 17 lesser known elements that are fundamental for some of the world's most advanced technologies. But the market for them is monopolized and that's causing global concern. Insight's Dana Lewis explains. They're called rare earth metals, and they are found in just about every tech device you use, from your cell phone to the TV you're watching this on. Rare earth are silvery metals found in tiny concentrations embedded in hard rock. Not so rare, actually, but difficult to isolate. Where do they come from? Well, that's where the supply chain raises concerns. Roughly 85% of the world's supply is cornered in China. And they are also strategic key in building missiles, radar systems, wind turbines. There are 17 rare earth elements with such catchy names as yttrium and praseodymium that power ultra thin but powerful magnets used in batteries and computers. The US started winding down its, uh, its uh, facilities and China really stepped in there. It saw an opportunity to uh, produce them. It's quite uh, labor intensive so economically um, profit margin for produ producing these um, materials is very low and China w w was available. China said, right, we'll produce them and the rest of the world said, hey, if China's producing them, we don't need to. No one really noticed until 2010 when a Chinese fishing trawler rammed a Japanese coast guard. Japan seized the trawler. China cut off rare earth exports to Japan for about 40 days and the world woke up to China's monopoly the U.S. filed a World Trade Organization complaint against China, which wouldn't sell metals to some competing American industry. Now, if China would simply let the market work on its own, we'd have no objections. But their policies currently are preventing that from happening. And they go against the very rules that China agreed to follow. And last year, one of the only American mines which produced rare earth metals declared bankruptcy because it couldn't compete with China's cheap labor market. China thus increased its stranglehold on rare metal production. That is a concern that China has its monopoly, and if it were to stop exports, then uh, you couldn't have your wind generators, you couldn't have your Priuses, you can't have your, your nuclear missile um, guidance systems. The worry is, what if China suddenly cut off exports of rare earth metals? What would happen to our electric vehicles or our cell phones? Well, experts say other countries could start producing those metals then because prices would rise and it would become more profitable. But some say that could take years, maybe even a decade. And some manufacturers, such as Honda, are making car batteries now that don't use rare earth metals. And there are reports the Pentagon has ordered stockpiling of rare earth metals just in case China decreases exports, with good strategic reasons. America's F-35 fighter jets, the most technically advanced weapon systems in history, each contain about half a ton of rare earth metals. I'm Dana Lewis, reporting for Insight. Well, to discuss that further, I'm joined in the studio by Andrea Seller, who's professor of chemistry at the University College London, with research interests in these rare earth elements, so much so you've brought some of your friends with you. Yeah, well, I thought I'd, I'd bring a little bit along. <laughs> these rare earth, they are what they say on the tin, aren't they? They are rare because they're difficult to come by. Well, it's interesting. The, the word rare is actually a historical artifact. They're not as rare as, as one might think. But back when they were first discovered in the 18th century, they were a complete puzzle because they'd only been found in one place. And, and the problem was that they seemed to be completely inseparable from each other. And you know, as you mentioned in your introduction, there are, depending on how you count them, between 14 and 17 of these. Mm. But from a chemistry point of view, you know, if you think about school and test tubes and boiling and crystallizing, they're all almost exactly the same in terms of their chemical properties. Right. 
But bah. it turns out, yeah, that, that their electronic properties, their magnetic properties, each one is really exquisitely unique. And so it can occupy a tiny niche in our technology yeah. that virtually nothing else can. Just give us an example. What are you clutching there? So what I have here is the element praseodymium. And it's one of a pair of elements, neodymium and praseodymium, the, the green twin and the new twin, as they were, they were called when they were first discovered. And these turn out to be an incredibly useful pair of elements because you can embed these two together in glass. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they completely cut out the glare from the flame when you're doing glass blowing, for example. So the, the intense sort of orange color that you get when you heat up materials, but particularly glass, is essentially notched out. It disappears. And so this is a really good example, I think, of how these elements were able to do very, very specific jobs. And in this case, what they're really doing is they're protecting workers from you know, the long-term effects of exposure to very bright light. In and the manufacturing for cataracts. process. In the right. manufacturing So that's process. part and parcel of this story. There was a little other rare earth element you were going to give me to play with. There. So, that, so here I've got that? a little lump of a metal called gadolinium. And you've got a protected bit of sort of tape on there, haven't now, you? Now, it's right? protected from the air because when you have them in the metallic form, yeah. then they will slowly, let's call them rust, they will tarnish. Okay. And eventually, they'll turn to a whitish powder. But gadolinium is incredibly important in medicine because you can use it, you can inject it as, you know, in a, in a sort of pharmaceutically acceptable form. You can inject it into a patient, and what it allows you to do is to get much better contrast, a much better image in MRI scans. So in the, the modern magnetic resonance scans, right, that are used in hospitals I've, across the I world. I know exactly about that. I've had that done. They put the contrast in, and then your x-ray is much, much better, right? Absolutely. And so what it, what it allows you to do is to distinguish, you know, different kinds of tissue, normal tissue from diseased tissue, the inside of a cell from the outside. And what is the characteristics of this um, metal that allow that to happen? Do we know the, what's the well, chemistry going on there? The crucial thing is really the number of electrons that you have in the atom itself. And the interesting thing about the, the lanthanides for me as a chemist is the fact that normally we think of the electrons as being the kind of business end of chemistry. In other words, the electrons are the glue that, that holds one thing to another. And in the case of these, these rare earth elements, what you find is that the, these, these active electrons, let's say, are actually buried deep inside the atom. And so they don't participate. They're kind of shielded from the outside world, but they can do their business. And so what they allow us to do, for example, is to build some of the strongest permanent magnets that we have. So one of the key applications turns out to be in electric motors. You know, now we're seeing the rise of all of these hybrid technologies, but particularly, you know, electric automobiles, of course, electric trains. And the fact that these use these regenerative engines. In other words, you have a motor which accelerates your car away. But when you want to brake, that you motor acts in reverse. It, that's right. It acts like a dynamo and it comes back. And, to and you do need this, these compounds to make that kind of switching behavior work. What you need is the strongest magnet you can to make the thing as small as possible. Sure. And so there you have these, these magnets, which you also find at the top of, of, uh, of, of wind turbines. Um, called neodymium iron boride. And you, know, you will have you know, hundreds of kilos of this stuff sitting at the top of the tower. And with those, we can make green electricity. So what you find is that these, these lanthanides, or rare earths, turn up in all sort of myriad applications. Everywhere you look, there are trace amounts. But getting hold of these things is tricky. We did a program segment about the Arctic um, last week. Is it likely that there are unexplored bits of planet Earth where you might find more of these and therefore be able to continue to do these things or bring the price down? It's certainly possible. And the interesting thing is that the price has been a complex mix of, I think, geopolitics and, on the other hand, kind of, you know, the madness of crowds kind of thing. Is that, you know, a few years ago when suddenly the price skyrocketed, I started receiving spam emails saying, hey, invest in praseodymium, you know, <laughs> buy in now at the bottom, you know, the price is going up. You thought, I don't need to, I've got uh, some a, in my cupboard. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, it was actually really quite worrying for us yeah. working, working in the area because suddenly our basic starting materials were becoming very, very expensive. Come, is there a workaround? Can the ingenuity of the tech sector not come up with saying, OK, we use that, that compound to do this or that element to do that. Can we not have a workaround? 
there is no question. I mean, one of the key things is using less of these things. And so, for example, in, in car exhaust catalysts, in the three-way catalyst that, that essentially removes the major pollutants, of course, not carbon dioxide, but certainly the nitrogen oxides and the unburnt fuel from the exhaust of a car. Well, there you have the element cerium at work. And one of the key things has been to reduce the amount of cerium to increase the surface area so that you have as much contact as possible for the tiny amount that you put in. So that's been, been crucial. But on the other hand, in some cases, it's been possible to find sort of alternatives, slightly cheaper alternatives, slightly different engineering designs, which allow you to reduce the amount that you need. So the idea that all the circuitry and the ingenuity that's gone into our mobile phones of today is somehow going to come to a grinding halt because you run out of source material, is that a little... Overblown? I think it's a little bit overblown. One of the very striking things is that the price ramped up hugely. Um, and at that point, there was, there was kind of panic and, and all kinds of alternatives started to be, to be found. And, and when that happened, as, as demand sort of tapered off, then of course that scare melted away and the prices did come down. Now they're substantially above where they were. But, of course, what it does is it makes economic, first of all, other sources, other processes, and the other thing is other possible technologies that weren't available before. Okay. And so the interesting thing is that they're, they're critical, but, of course, our ingenuity always allows us, perhaps, at a price, to find an alternative. Andrew, great to meet you. Let me hand that. But what was that one again? So this is gadolinium. Yeah, right. It sounds named, like something out of a sci-fi movie. Well, it's, it's right there. Named after a Finnish chemist called Johannes Gadolin. Well, we thank him very much indeed, and we thank you too. This is Insight. Coming up, the two tech giants going head-to-head -head in court.